Hey you folks, Quilly Keen here and welcome to Let's Try Twilight Struggle. The Cold War, 1945 to 1989. This is a real-life board game that has the distinction of having occupied the number one spot on BoardGameGeek.com for many, many, many years. It was actually only displaced from that number one spot, I think, last year, and it was pushed off by Lords of Waterdeep and Pandemic Legacy. Um, what's particularly remarkable about the fact that it's so highly ranked on BoardGameGeek is the fact that it's only a two player game which to me is like one of the reasons i haven't gone out and bought it before I, I don't have a physical version of twilight struggle i've never played it in real life um because you know i think board games it's a group activity why would i want a two-player game not only that the box and i've looked at it plenty of times in my my real life uh, you know friendly local neighborhood uh gaming shop the box looks you know kind of old-fashioned and weird i mean the game only came out in 2006 um but it looks really old-fashioned and even when you look at like sort of the pictures of what the actual game itself looks like it's like this doesn't look that impressive it also looks weirdly complicated and that's one of the things i thought ah oh, maybe it's so highly ranked because it's a super complex game and you know it's kind of esoteric and it's sort of a an elitist thing and then the people who like it really like it it turns out i feel i haven't played the digital version now i would compare this a lot more to something like chess or go or something the game rules are not that complicated but the competitive aspect is huge Huge! There is um, lots of organized tournaments for Twilight Struggle, really sort of like championship level play. Lots of breakdown and analysis of all the gameplay that happens in a particular match. It's really, really, really brilliant, and it's got a fantastic theme. So the players play as either the USA or the USSR, and you are fighting over control of the world, effectively, during the Cold War. Um, you see a lot of the themes that you will see, you know, that you think of in the Cold War. You've got the DEFCON track, you've got, like, the space race, but you have lots and lots and lots and lots of just influencing of countries, as well as, you know, maybe uh, manufacturing some coups in different places, that sort of thing. Um, the Twilight Struggle is available on Steam as of, you know, I think it came out, it all came out last year, the digital version. It's available on Steam. Uh, it's also available uh, for mobile devices. Um, I actually hadn't realized it was out on Steam. I actually got it for Android. Um, before I realized it was actually on Steam over here. There's this in-app store for a couple of, like, you know, weird extra stuff that I don't think really truly matters. Um, the base game, what you buy, is the same as, like, the physical board game. These are just, like, weird little extras and fiddly things and whatever. I would not... I'm not concerned by this. Sometimes that sort of idea turns me off, especially on, like, a PC version where you're paying... I don't know, for me it was, like, about 15 Canadian bucks to, uh, to purchase. Um, and But I'm like, oh, yeah, none, none of that seems to matter in any way whatsoever. So... Um, you correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Uh, in terms of settings, there's not a ton of stuff to do over here, but there's some. I'm leaving these settings as default here for the animation speed and whatnot, but again, if, we, if you're looking at this and you're like, oh, it feels a little slow paced, well, that would be why you can you can turn that up. You can access the full gallery of cards over here, as well as the rule book, of course, because it's a real life version um, board game as well. You can download the actual rule book, which is like one of the most like dry presentations of the rule book it is. It's like, this is rule 8.2.1. This is the, it's like, it feels like, like a government document, which actually fits the theme quite well. And I gotta say, the rules are turbo clear. Um, the tutorial, I, I felt like it taught me some things, but left a couple of like question marks still for me. Um, but the rule book really helped to finish that off. So there you go. We do have a profile, which actually, I guess I haven't set here on PC. Um, you get to choose your avatar for, you know, when you're playing as, uh, as, as different teams. Um, and you can rename yourself. So I should rename my avatar to, uh, how about Quill? There you go. I will be Quill over here and that's going to be fine. Okay. Um, as per usual, I have not tried the online mode, uh, at all. So I cannot, um... I cannot, you know, confirm or deny how well it works, uh, but we're going to play offline here. We are going to create a game. Uh, it is worth noting you can play Hot Seat over here, two human players. Um, because the you do have a hand of cards that is supposed to be hidden on PC, this might be a little bit awkward. I feel that this would work fantastically well um, with sort of tablet play where you're swapping the tablet back and forth or something of that nature. I'm going to play against the AI over here. So yeah, you play as the USA or the USSR. The USSR is like playing white in chess. The USSR always plays first um, every round, uh, tends to set the, like, sets up the momentum. Uh, the US might be ha have to be a little bit more reactive to the USSR being a little bit more active. Um, 
without any kind of handicap whatsoever in in championship level play my understanding is that the ussr has a slight edge i don't think that particularly matters here um the other thing that's nice is a newer player at playing as the us you do get to play a little bit more reactive um and therefore you don't have to like just look at this blank board and be like i have no idea where to start let him start, and then we'll take an action after that. Uh, and you can see here, there's a few options for different game types where you can tweak a few optional rules. Uh, the Chinese Civil War rule, for example, is one that is available in, in the main rulebook, as far as I can tell. And a couple of different... Late War lets you start later in the game, um, because there, a lot of games may not make it to the Late War. We're just going to play Standard Game. Uh, you can add the optional cards here or not. That's without unlocking any extra DLC or anything like that. So, you know, it's not like the promo uh, things. So, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and start with that. Got the, uh, you can choose your sides initially or get it randomized. That's what this little thingy is for. But uh, yeah, we'll go with the start standard game setup over here. So, lovely little nuke over here. Here is the game board. And like I said, looking at this, I was always like, I don't know. It looks so complicated and hairy. It's not as scary as I initially thought. So, right now we are in the game setup phase over here. So, we get the world map. We can, we can zoom in. We can pan around. Okay, that was a little bit awkward. There we go. We can pan around the, the map. Um, it's also got these buttons over here. This is particularly handy on the mobile thing. So you can just zoom in to Europe, uh, the Middle East, Asia. Um, this would be South America, Central America, Africa over here. Yeah, so you got a few zooms over here. There's a few different areas. Uh, you can see these sort of like... Um, these indicators here for all of Europe. This is this is part of the digital version that it gives you a very handy little display of how um, how the balance is in Europe. Blue being USA, red being the Soviet Union, um, and gray being neutral in the middle over here. So in the initial setup, there are a certain amount of influence tokens that get placed on various countries. Some of them are fixed. For example, as the US, you will always start with two on Canada, five in the UK, one in Israel, Iran, South Africa, We've got four in Australia, we've got the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, Panama, I think I've covered them all, something like that. And the USSR starts with a few fixed ones as well. And then after that, there are extra influence tokens that the Soviet Union gets to place first. Again, the Soviet Union will always go, will go first. And now it's the US's turn to place seven additional influence tokens. Um, now, I do actually have the Marshall Plan here, which I will probably play as my headline card, which does tweak a few things that I might do. The standard opener, apparently, I've been trying to read some strategy, and it's like it's like reading about chess, right? Like, you get your standard openers in chess or whatnot, um, and there's a standard opener with your seven influences the U.S. is probably put four in West Germany and, like, three in Italy or something like that. It gives you um, really good control over some battleground countries, as well as sets up a little bit of a wall that matters for certain things later on. But things are a little bit different with the Marshall Plan because you can get some bonus points um, because the Marshall Plan will let me play influence in each of seven non-Soviet controlled Western European countries. So Europe is one area in terms of the game for certain things, um, but it is semi divided into West and East. It's a little hard to see, but the Western countries are slightly darker blue and the Eastern countries are slightly lighter blue. You can tell most obviously with Austria and Finland, which count as both West and East over here. You can see there's a slight slash over there. It's a little, like, hard to tell, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. It doesn't matter that much. There's just a few cards that trigger one way or another. The nice thing about the digital version is when you can do something, like, you get blinking countries that, like, so you know, oh, this is where I'm supposed to do stuff. So as the U.S., I can place influence in, well, right now, my seven influence remember, setup only goes in Europe. I can't put it anywhere else. So uh, what I'm going to do then is normally I would go with like four and three. It seems to be a very standard opener on Western Germany and Italy, uh, but I'll do one less because the Marshall Plan will allow me to put some more. So I'm going to go one, two, three, and we'll talk about what this does in a minute. Uh, we'll put two in Italy, and then the other standard opener for this might be something like we can go with one in Greece and one in Turkey. Um, start to get a little bit of a presence and a little bit of pressure towards the Middle East, for example. Control the Balkans. Uh, we've got this commit button over here. And, you know, some of these buttons on the side feel like the sort of thing that's actually very convenient on mobile because you can just hit it with a thumb. It's no less convenient on PC. I think as a convention, you might have like sort of a cancel and back button maybe over here or something like that. But I mean, it's totally fine. So we're going to click that. You got cool little like voiceovers and things like that. Uh, in the game very thematic so the core gameplay 
each round, well, I don't know, each turn, I guess it's turn one over here, is played over six action rounds. And then a little bit later, you get seven action rounds per turn. We'll have, we have eight cards in hand, we have six rounds each to play our cards. However, the first thing that happens is this headline phase. So, this is our first opportunity to play a card. I love how things get blacked out. Everything is, like, very thematic. So let's talk about these cards for the very first time. There are, there's a, there's a few different types of cards, but the vast majority of cards are effectively like this. They are a card, the early war is just the deck they come from. There is a shared deck between both the US and the Soviet Union. We both draw from the same deck of cards. Now, some of the events are US events. They're represented by a white star over here. Some of them are Soviet events. They have a red star over here. Some can be played are, are, are events that work for either side they have a split star like this okay that will matter later on all the cards well as far as i know all the cards also have an ops value that's the number in the top left corner over here um these range mostly from one to four i think the scoring cards technically count as a zero um a four is the most powerful and one is a little bit weaker now these cards all of these cards can be played either just for their ops value in a variety of different ways or for their event now the tricky part is that the ones with the best ops value tend to also be some of the most powerful um events as well now it would actually be super super tempting for me to lead with this card as my headline so what the headline is the headline is both the soviet and the u.s player choose one card to play purely for the event right now we flip them both over simultaneously the one with the higher ops value triggers first if it matters um and then they both resolve the event and then we go into normal turns i am going to start with the marshall plan over here because this will allow me well two things it unlocks the use of nato uh, which is another card um and lets me add um like seven more influence on the map which is pretty potent so we're going to go ahead and headline that so we both play them face down we both reveal them and the one with the highest number triggers first, if it matters. So the Marshall Plan, I'm resolving it now, and I get to play seven influence in countries not already controlled by the Soviet Union. Um, actually, is it not controlled or not with the president? I don't know. But you can see the glowing ones where I'm allowed to do it. So I'm going to put another token in West Germany here to uh, solidify control. You see how it turned from like, see how there's like a white background on these numbers, and here there's a blue background? Each country in the top right corner has a stability marker. Um, this is how hard it is to like influence and change this country. So West Germany has a stability of four. So I need four more influence in this country to have control of it over my opponent. If the Soviet Union had one influence here, I would need a total of five to be above four to gain that. Um, so uh, Greece has a stability of two. I only have one, so I don't have control over it here. Um, I'm going to go and put a token both in Turkey and Greece to lock that down. I'm going to put an extra token in Italy, because Italy, every one with this red name in the title bar, these are battleground countries. They're particularly important to control. So we'll do that. Um, I'll put some points into France over here. Again, it's a battleground place, so that'll be important. That actually takes care of all the battlegrounds. Um, other than that, I, I'm not sure where to put my last two influence. Um, I could try to compete a little in Finland. I think, like, sort of consolidating a power block is probably a good idea. Um, Portugal slash Spain, over here, or Spain slash Portugal, uh, is adjacent to both France and Italy. These lines represent adjacency. Um, and controlling that does give you an edge over battling those two battlegrounds. So, let's put a point in there. That's going to be okay. Um, and just because of who we are, I feel like we've got to put something in the Benelux. But... Um, but I feel like I want to put a thing in Austria here as a bit of a blockade. So we're going to do that. Now, the Soviet Union played Warsaw Pact Formed, which allows them to remove U.S. influence from four countries in Eastern Europe or add uh, five uh, Soviet influence in Eastern Europe. So we'll see how he goes. He might remove me from, say, Turkey and Greece. And maybe that would have affected where I move things, but I wasn't looking at things. I was too busy talking. But that's why it's, like, a little bit important to see the interaction. So you can see, like, a lot of the gameplay is simple. Okay, you're putting down points on things. Sure. Now, making the decision as to where the hell those points should be, that's a big question mark. No, I didn't catch exactly where he did it, but it's okay. So now it's the Soviet Union's first real turn. They'll do a thing 
and then it'll be my turn and I'll sort of explain the options over here. You can see a little timer here as the Soviet player is thinking, the AI is thinking here. Do, 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 do. Oh, he might use up all his time, at which point I guess he'll just use whatever key came up as best. Uh, ooh, he, he's going to play US, UN Intervention for its actual value, which is okay, which then lets him play. All right. UN Intervention lets him play another card without triggering its event, yada, yada. Okay, we'll explain that now. All right, so he's got a little bit more influence over here. We're good. Here's how the normal gameplay of a normal turn. This is a normal turn at this point. We're all done in the setup. I can choose any card in my hand to play it. Now, when I choose to play it, so I can zoom in here, I can choose to play it in a number of different ways. I can play it for the event itself, or I can play it for its op value. That, those are basically the two big categories. Either I'm playing it for the event itself, or I'm playing it for its op value. The ops value can be played to place more influence. So here, if I played it for place influence, I would get four more influence that I could put anywhere on the board. That is actually the most common way to use a card, which is interesting. I can use it for realignment roles. It's a, that's basically, that's a way to remove influence from a country. That, that's its primary purpose, is to remove influence from one or more countries. Um, there is the coup attempt, which both sides are basically going to be rolling dice, and the winning side is going to get to purge enemy influence from our country. And if they roll really well, and they fully purge enemy influence from a country, they can actually add influence to that country themselves. This is a very aggressive um, action, and in fact increases your position on the military track, and can lower the DEFCON rating. So, DEFCON! Right? You've heard this before. You hear it in, like, all these war movies and things like that. Defense condition. It starts at five. Five, even though it's the biggest number, is actually the most peaceful thing. Right? It always sounds scary, like, oh, we're going to DEFCON 4. Okay, DEFCON 4 is not that bad. It's only, like, slightly more sketchy. DEFCON 1 represents full-on nuclear war. And the interesting thing about this game is the player who is responsible for dropping the DEFCON status to 1 and initiate a global nuclear war instantly loses. You lose if you're responsible for starting a nuclear war. Pretty neat, huh? I think that's very cool. So managing this is kind of important. There's also a couple of side effects um, as the DEFCON status um, lowers over here. Uh, coups and realignments gets banned first in Europe, then Asia, then Middle East over here. Um, you also need, you will lose points if you produce, if you perform fewer military options than the DEFCON number over here. So if the DEFCON's at five, I need to produce five points worth of military operations or I will lose victory points. Here, by the way, is our current score of zero over here. We are even. As we do things, one side or the other will earn points and it's going to tilt the balance. The first player to reach plus 20 points in their favor wins. So I'll do things and I'll go up, like, oh, be two points in my favor. And then the Soviet Union will do something and all of a sudden um, he canceled that out and earned some extra points. And now it's like one point in his favor. And we're tugging back and forth. If one of us gets it all the way to 20 in our favor, the game instantly ends with a victory. Uh, otherwise, um, when it gets to the last round, whoever's got the most points wins at that point. So what am I going to do here? I'm tempted to play the Red Scare for the event itself, because it's really, really, really powerful. Um, all further operations card played by your opponent this turn are minus one to their value. On the other hand, I could just play it for the value of four over here. I could also try to save this in my hand to play this as my headline next turn, because uh, he's already had an action, but there's this is still pretty early on. You know what? I'm just going to play this for the event, and I've got to say... Um, you actually end up playing most of your cards for their op value rather than the event. It's a little uh, deceptive, but it is there. Still, I think it's probably going to be worth it. Effectively, um, I'm probably going to give him about minus five points for the rest of the uh, the, the turn here, right? Because minus one per turn, he had five more left. Ah, the Soviet Union is playing the China card. And he's using it to, it, to um, perform a military coup in the Philippines. So the China card's really interesting because notice I have the China card now. China card's worth four. When you play it, it passes to the other player. The USSR already starts with it. 
but when you play it, it passes to the other person. This is their way to, to abstract the way that China sort of worked in the, um, the Cold War. You can't actually put influence points in China directly, but you do have this China card that goes back and forth. Very, very interesting. Now, when it passes to you, it passes face down. You can't play it on the turn that you receive it. So the Philippines, which I believe I had one influence point in, have now been cooed by the um, by the Soviets. All right, fair enough. But we'll have that next time. Um, other than that, my cards are actually kind of weak sauce. I'm almost wondering if I should have played um, Red Scare differently, but I don't know. This is okay. Um, so let's talk about one of these cards of the Soviet event, right? Let's say I want to play... well. I would not want to play this card for the event by itself. And in fact, I can't. I can't play this card for the event by itself because it's a Soviet event. It adds Soviet influence in each of any four African and or Southeast Asian country. This is a bad event for me. It's really good for the Soviets. So I can't play it for the event itself. But the thing is, I can still play it for its op value of two. The catch is, if I play this card for the ops value the event will still trigger for the Soviets. That does not apply to my own. If I'm playing, so this is one of my own cards, the Formosan Resolution, it's got a white star, it's my event. If I play it for the op value, then the event doesn't trigger. But the Soviet card does trigger the event over here, which is kind of interesting. Now, for that reason, it's almost bizarrely, you're more often going to play, I would say, your, your personal cards for ops value like it's it's weird. You're quite you're quite happy to play like this Formosan resolution. I would often be quite happy to play just for the ops value. And what happens is when you play it like that, it goes into the discard pile, which will get reshuffled into the deck. And maybe the Soviets will pick it up and then when they play it for an ops value, it will then trigger the event at that point. Kind of interesting. Um so this does make it so that Taiwan is treated as a battleground country for scoring purposes. If the U.S. controls Taiwan when the Asian scoring card is played or during the final round... Okay. It's not a battleground country for any other game purposes. All right. That is an interesting thing to know. So battleground states, I already talked to you about, have these red backgrounds over here. Um, and they are worth a lot when you play a scoring card, which you don't have one, so we can't talk about it yet. But basically, it's a card you play as your turn, and you a bunch of scores get point depending on... Or a bunch of points get scored, depending on who has more control over that region, basically. Um, ah, all right, I gotta play something. The fact that he cooed the Philippines makes me think he might have the, um, the Southeast Asian scoring card. Or the Asian scoring card, which, because this counts as, as that territory as well. So it makes me feel like I might need to make some plays here. I might want to solidify South Korea, for example. So let's go ahead and play the Formosan Resolution for influence. And I'm going to put two influence tokens in South Korea. There we go. Get me a little bit more of a presence over here in case he was looking to score in here. I will have to do some coups soon, though. Might want to coup the Philippines, actually. I, I mean, I don't have a power card for it, but I do need to uh, get some mill ups going on here. So what's your next action there, buddy? Uh, you are going to spend your, the Olympic Games, not for the Olympic Games itself, but you're going to try to realign West Germany, which would have removed some of my influence there. It didn't work at all, so that's good. I still have all my influence there. Um, I don't... Th I don't... I wonder if I want to use actually play the Indo-Pakistani War, because war cards do count as mill ops. Now, I don't have a presence in either country, but here's what I could do. If I play the influence, can I actually play influence over here? Yeah, I could put two influence points in Pakistan and get Pakistan to war against India and get me some points. And it gets me more presence in Asia as well. Let's do that. Now, this will trigger decolonization for its event for my opponent over here. So they'll get to play some dudes down, but that's okay. Hey, I got my first achievement! First time playing on Steam here. So he's trying to decide where to put some token from decolonization. He's going to put, get to put uh, one token in four countries, I think. Or I guess it's four influence and no more than two? No, one in, all, in four countries. Which does actually give him control over Angola, the Sahara States, and Laos, Cambodia, because they only have a stability rating of one. He's also trying to gain influence in Thailand over here. So, if I play this, India or Pakistan invade each other. 
All right, let's do it. Oh, no. Oh, that's right. It's my opponent's turn. He was just, he was resolving. Uh, yeah, he's got a lot more influence over here. All right, we're going to play war. And which one am I clicking on? Invades the other. Am I clicking on select war country? Pakistan? No, Pakistan would be the target. That's not what I want. India is the target. I guess no matter what, the odds are the same. Oh, and replace all influence. Okay, hold on. I misunderstood what that would be used for. It's used to remove influence, not add. Hmm. I don't like, like, I've got such weak, weak ass cards here. I wonder if I should just play this with points and try to get more influence over here. Because I'm very concerned that he's definitely going to be playing some sort of scoring card here. Can I, um, well, I wonder what my odds of cooing over here will be. Well, not too bad. So this gives you a preview. Uh, so the way it goes is we both roll dice, and we've got, um, there's a coup defense score, and uh, there's an operation point score. I'm only using a two-point operation. So we both roll, we add these values together, and then we check the difference. Um, and so if I roll, um, if I roll, uh, that's not bad. So a one or two basically results in no change, because I have nothing to remove from here, so the Soviets stay where they are, right? A one or two, they stay with two influence. If I roll a three, I will successfully remove one of their influence. They will no longer have control over the battleground. If I roll a four, I will remove both. If I roll a five or a six, I'll actually end up with some influence there. You know what? It seems like worthwhile going. Now, this will degrade the DEFCON status to four because I'm doing a coup in a battleground country. Non-battleground countries don't degrade. Let's do that. If we roll well, uh, we rolled a one. That sucks. It still degrades DEFCON, and it still counts as a two-point mill ops, which is going to be important at the end of the turn because it would otherwise cost me some points. That was very disappointing, though. Still expecting him to play an Asian scoring card. Possibly Southeast Asian scoring card. Now, the interesting thing about scoring cards is you have to play them at some point during the turn. Um, nuclear test ban. Uh, because if you don't, you instantly lose. <laughs> so you're forced to play the scoring cards. I, I mean, I may be misreading the situation. You know, he's trying to get some influence in South Africa. Um, oh man, this is brutal. I think we're going to keep playing some coups here. Now, this is going to be a little annoying. Now, I don't have any influence in Egypt. This will give um, the Soviet Union control over Egypt, but I guess we'll deal with that first. Uh, well, tell you what, resolve your event first. Now, you get you get to choose and how what order to do it in. Now, I could then try to actually coup this, but the odds are pretty bad. Uh, and Thailand's gotten a lot worse because this is a lower point. Um, let's just go with Laos over here. It won't change the DEFCON status. I'll actually have to do another coup, but that's okay. Let's try to do that. Wow, we rolled a six. We actually end up with four influence on Laos, which is way more than you need to control it. What? You had the Europe scoring card. So, okay. So here's your first look at the scoring card. I gotta say, this is almost completely illegible. <laughs> but the Soviets had to play the scoring card because, again, if you have it in your hand at the end of your turn, you just lose because you're not supposed to hold it. Um, it represents accidentally maybe pushing the button and starting a nuclear war. So both, sky both sides score points. You earn three points if you have a quote-unquote presence in Europe. You earn seven points if you have a quote-unquote domination over Europe. Now, you don't earn both. You just earn whichever one is higher. If you actually have control over Europe, you instantly win. The European scoring card is the only one that has the automatic victory option over here. Most of the others just score more and more and more points. You also get plus one points for each controlled battleground country and plus one per country control that is adjacent to an enemy superpower. So if I were to control a country next to the Soviet Union, I get bonus points for doing that. Now, as it stands out, both of us have a presence. Both of us have exactly two battlegrounds. None of us are adjacent. We both earn five points, which means effectively neither one of us earn any points, but he was forced to play it. That was his final action. He had no choice. 
But yeah, I assumed he was going to play a scoring card over here. So for my final action, I'm still one short on the Defcon track over here, which means I would lose a point at the end of the round. So I guess I'm going to go for one more coup attempt. Um, remove all U.S. influence in Romania. USSR gains sufficient influence in Romania for control. That would give him three free influence in Romania. I could just play this for the coup, but... I'm kind of tempted to do that, because, I mean, that feels kind of annoying to do. On the other hand, I can just play this for the event, for the free space race. No, you know what? I'm going to play this for the coup. And now that I'm a, I am have a country adjacent to Thailand, I will um, have a slightly better chance of the coup. Still not great, but it gets, still give me that one military ops, which is okay. I could try to coup Israel, which isn't going to go well. Uh, Lebanon? Lebanon's going to be pretty good. Let's try doing that. Very good odds of having it do really well for us. There we go. It gives us control over Lebanon, uh, which gives us more adjacency towards Israel, which is a battleground state. So, we're at DEFCON 4. Both sides have created, have four mil ops points uh, scored during the previous round, so neither one of us lose any points. It's one of the systems to force you to do things that might drop the DEFCON level. So, we're turn two. You know, it's like a few years ahead in the future. Um, and uh, we're going to get it started. So we all go up to eight cards again. DEFCON always goes up or improves by one level um, at the start of each turn. So it's recovered back up to five. We've got to do a headline phase over here. I think containment is exactly what I want to do over here. All further operations card played, played by the U.S. this turn add one to their value. Mmm, that's pretty sexy. So we're going to headline containment. Uh, and the Soviet Union have played Comic-Con. They're, they're waiting to, ro um, to, um, um, cosplay. So, Council for Mutual Economic Assistance adds one USSR influence in each of four non-US controlled countries in Eastern Europe. All right, well, good for him. So he's going to get some influence over here. Fair enough. Now, I still don't have a scoring card. They may have drawn one. Now, we know that European scoring is currently in the discard pile, so that's not going to come up again anytime soon. So I may not have to stress here, or maybe I should. I could be starting some wars. Um, oh, right, it's his turn. He's going to play. De Gaulle leads France. Oh, no, he's using it for a coup. All right. He has attempted to coup Pakistan over here. He failed. The DEFCON level did drop because Pakistan is a battleground state. That also gave him three mil ops over here. Hmm... So, yeah, these are technically um, Soviet events. So if I play them for the for the ops points, which is the only thing I can do with them, the event will also trigger. So North Korea invades South Korea, for example. Um, they uh, this So they would get to do it. They would get to roll. They do get a minus one to their die for every U.S.-controlled country adjacent to South Korea, um, which right now is nothing, although I could control the U.S. just by playing the U.S.-Japan Mutual Defense Pact. Now, it is a four points card. If I play this, it instantly gives me control of Japan, and no one can coup or real do realignment rolls in Japan. The thing is, I think there's basically no reason to play this for the event, especially right now, because um, this will only give me three influence in Japan, because I've got one, I need four, so it'll give me three. I could just play for four, and in fact, I would play it, um, yeah, I would play it for four. Which sounds probably like the way to go. And then these are all Soviet event cards, which is kind of brutal. But yeah, uh, so I'm going to place influence in Japan. One, two, three, to gain control over there. Um, if I can end up controlling Taiwan, then I really wouldn't feel as weird about triggering the Korean War here. Which, actually, I could do next turn. Because what I could do is I can place my last influence here, and my next turn, I could play the Korean War for points, put two guys in Taiwan, and then let the event trigger. I don't know if that's a good idea, but that's what I'm going to do. I don't know who gets the mill ops from this. I don't know if it's going to be me. I think it might be me. I hope it is. We're going to find out. What you going to do there, uh, big Russian bear? So, I mean, the theme, obviously, 
is cool. Could you imagine playing with someone you're thinking about things? As long as you don't have someone who, like, takes too long on their turns. Like, you might need a, a chess clock. Oh, he mildly success, uh, succeeded in a coup in Lebanon. He only rolled a one, but apparently I was good enough to take one uh, influence away. We still have control over Lebanon, but... Now, if he's playing cards over here, he could have a Middle East scoring card. I don't know... Um, I don't know the full card set. I don't know if the early war stage has scoring cards for every spot. I don't think so. I don't think so. Like, for example, I don't think Central or South America scoring cards are in the er old ones, but I'm not sure. So, Korean War. Um, I'm going to place influence first. Gain control over Taiwan. Uh, why do I get an extra one? Oh, right. I get the plus one over here. To a maximum of four, right. I didn't get the extra point on my Japan one. But yeah, that's true. So I get an extra point over here. Uh, which I will use... I will use to gain control over Iran. One of the nice things, if you have control over a country, then it costs two points to get one influence in a country. Um, until you break that. So if uh, the Soviet Union wanted to take, wanted to put a point, uh, an influence in Iran, it would cost two points to get the first one. But that would break my control over Iran. So then after that, it would just be one point, one point, one point. So overkilling a country like Poland over here actually has a value because this would be extremely hard for me to take over. All right, we're gonna commit to that. The war is gonna start. So the war failed. It looks like it did give him the milops. But the nice thing about this, all events with an asterisk here, remove from play if used in this event. That's what the asterisk is for. So, um, the Korean War will never reappear again. And I made sure to trigger the Korean War in a situation where I felt like I had the best chance of winning the Korean War. So there we go. So he got no victory points um, and didn't do anything to South Korea. It did require investing a fair amount of points over here, although Japan's a pretty good place. So, it's his turn. He's going to try to make a move. Duck and cover. So, he's playing this for the points. He's, uh, he must be doing a coup. No, he's doing, he's playing it for influence. Okay. We can go and reference the turns here. Uh, duck and cover. Uh, can I load up the card and actually see what it does? Is there a way to check the discard pile? Or the remove from... Oh, right here. No, that's how many have been removed from the game. Oh, right here. There we go. Here's the, the cards that were played. So, by playing this... So, he got three points, okay, to use to influence things. Um, but because he was playing a U.S. card, the event itself triggered. Uh, I love the art, man. That's like all public domain art from like that period. It's great. So, that degraded the DEFCON by one level, which actually makes it a little easier for me to hit my target. Then the U.S. earns VPs equal to five... Minus the current DEFCON level. So he gave me two points. Because five minus three is equal to two. He gave me two points by playing this. But it sure beats me playing this at a different time. What are you going to do? Hum. Wow. You know what I'm thinking? Why don't I play Blockade? and discard destalinization. This will get rid of this event in a place where I have control over it. Because could you imagine, like, I've played all my big power cards and then he drops a blockade on his turn and I'm forced to lose all my influence over West Germany? That feels pretty poopy. I'm going to discard this. And then use blockade to... Let's try coup. How's our chance of cooing Israel? Uh, pretty much non-existent. Okay. Syria? Syria's got some possibilities. Uh, the Sahara states, actually, I kind of dig that idea. Or even... South Africa, mm, it's a lot harder. We have a chance to take control over Egypt. 
this would lower the DEFCON level some more, because it's a battleground state. I'm not sure that bothers me, actually. Although, okay, the Arab-Israeli war. If we trigger that... The more countries we control adjacent to Israel, including Israel itself, will give us a bonus. Let's see if we can't get Egypt. No, we failed. Now, I don't think this war will change the DEFCON level. So, no one can do anything to drop the DEFCON level anymore, or you instantly lose. So, if I'm going to do any more stuff... That gave me a poem, playing a headline, yada yada yada. Uh, he's going to do more African control. Actually, quite a bit. He's got control over a lot of the battlegrounds here. Um... Okay, I've got all the mill ops I need. What I'm going to do, I'm going to play the China card for realignment rules. Realignment rules let you um, potentially remove influence. All they do is remove influence, but they don't raise the DEFCON level, and I'm going to get four of these rolls, and I can spread them out. So I'm going to just try to strip away all of his influence um, over here in Africa. In particular, I should have started with the battlegrounds. Come on. It's like XCOM. Oh my god. How many 70% rolls did I just fail there? Are you kidding me? Oh my god, it is like playing XCOM. Alright, what you gonna do, bad boy? If you've got the Africa scoring thing, this would probably be a fine time to play it. I assume you would get the domination one. Okay, so he's playing a card to space race. Oh, he failed his roll. That's good. So Space Race is one way to get rid of cards that you don't want to play and have trigger the event. So Space Race is up here. The way it works is you you play a card that's worth at least two ops, later on three ops, but early on two ops. Then you roll a die, and so for example for the Earth Satellite you've got to roll one to three to succeed. If you do that, then you advance your marker to this step over here, Earth Satellite, and the first person to get here would earn two victory points, the second person earns one. The third rank over here, Animal in Space, isn't worth any victory points, but at that point you can start playing two Space Race cards per turn. Um, Man in Space is worth two points, or zero. Man in Earth Orbit isn't worth any points, but um, forces your opponent to choose and show their headline card first, so you have options to counteract that, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of interesting things over here, but it doesn't play into the main point of the game of trying to control things. But the nice thing about it is, let's say we played the Arab-Israeli war over here. Um, for the space race, it would not trigger the event, which might be important right now because we have no control over things. What's socialist government? Remove U.S. influence in Western Europe by a total of three influence points, removing no more than two per country. The thing is, it's worth three op points, so he could remove three and then I could add three. It would be sort of a neutral move. It might not be the end of the world here to just play that. I mean, mostly spinning our, our, our wheels, but I could use it to do a coup as well. We don't have to stress super lots about Europe because we know the scoring card is done, although we have to gain back. Um, just out of curiosity, if we were to try to coup... Oh, I can't coup a battleground because it would blow me up. And um, the Middle East, actually, because the DEFCON level is so low, you can't do anything over here. So it would just be maybe like realignment rolls over there, which I'm not convinced. Well, again, he might just drop a big freaking scoring card over here um, and earn lots of points. Oh, yeah, this would give... This would remove and give control of Romania. Romania... Oh, yeah, it's still that one over there. Um, that may be a good one to just space race. Well, I can't space race it. It's not worth enough points. Indecision paralysis! Or decision paralysis. Whichever one. I can't decide. Um, okay, I've got control over Lebanon. You know what? Here's what we're going to do. Can I gain control of Jordan? Yes, I will. That will give me control of two adjacent countries, Israel. Let's trigger the war. Oh, and I get an extra influence, right, because I've got the plus one thing going on. That is true. Let's 
could start in Algeria, actually. All right. He failed his war. Excellent. Because we got two countries. It was minus two to his roll. Whew. That is the second war event that we've forced to trigger in the best possible situation for us. Well, I think what we're going to do is we're going to put a cut in here. Obviously, there's going to be a few videos going here. Um, and again, I don't really know... I haven't played enough to really know how, like, the strongest way to play. Um, oh, that triggered the Truman Doctrine. Remove all Soviet influence markers in one uncontrolled country in Europe. Ah, which is just going to be one of these guys. Oh, we could remove it from Finland. Sure, we'll do that. I mean, Finland's a little further out of the way and may not be quite as relevant, but removes the most influence, so there we go. And he's using it for influence. He's going to put one token down. He's Well, that was his last turn. So he doesn't have any scoring cards this turn. All right, I'll finish this round, and then we'll put in the cut. Um, I'm tempted to just throw this into space. Now, uh, oh, this is not a discardy event anyway. Right? Because sometimes it's tempting to, like, play this and get it removed from the game when it when it works out as a good opportunity, but it's not one of those. Yeah, I'm just going to throw it into space. Roll. Hey, we succeeded. We got two victory points for the first Earth satellite. Lovely. We've got all our mill ops. I'm now five points ahead of my opponent here. Whew. All right, we're going to put a cut in here. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Check the links in the doobly-doo uh, for, uh, for I don't know, I guess the Steam page or whatever. Up uh, And the um, uh, the Board Game Geek page, which is really good. If you haven't been to, like, BoardGameGeek.com, like, the, the forums there are, like, a great place to discuss strategy and see all the game components. You usually find the PDFs for the rules and things like that. Really, really handy site. Uh, Twilight Struggle. It's a real-life board game. And apparently has a really well done digital version. Just like the board game, it feels like there's a lot of kind of crap on the screen. But again, I it's not that complicated to play. Compli hard to play right, but not hard to play. Thanks for watching. See you next time.